where I first started wanting to be an artist in my career, um, and I, I, I don't know, I, I mean, I've heard a lot of stories from different artists and we all end up being somewhat in the same bat in some ways. Uh, I just did it from the time I remember I was creating comics when I was about six years old. And I would write the words in and then my older brother sometimes would help me write them. And so I did comic books, just created them right from like, I, I literally remember when I was six years old. The other, the other, or the other uh, fun thing that happened when I was, uh, I wasn't, again, uh, a student that, you know, normally, I wasn't in the A class all the time. But in art, I was, and, and uh, I found out in a funny kind of way in that when I was in second grade, uh, the, I, I did a drawing of a shark with a, uh, with a skin diver. And uh, I had this, this shark twirling around the skin diver, and the skin diver was I, one of those guys in a big you know, tank with the bubbles coming up. But I didn't have any idea that it was like, I, I know now because my wife was an uh, art teacher, so I know all the, the somewhat the uh, steps of how the perception goes. And of course they brought all the people, all the teachers brought people in to look at this piece of artwork. I had no idea, but it was because I put overlap and I had, you know, I had action and things in it. So I guess I was sort of slated right from the, you know, whatever my... Uh, bio background from, you know, the history of before I was born somehow that was hotwired to do art. Yeah, so uh, I had, I have a lot of early influences, you know, when I, when I went to college, um, there was no illustration major, you, you I had to major in uh, graphic arts. So uh, I had to pretty much find my influences on my own, and I, and I didn't know I didn't know any illustrators back then. I just, you know, uh, you know who I knew back then? I knew the guys from Mad Magazine, and I've talked to a lot of illustrators. Uh, you know, Mort Drucker was like my god, and Jack Davis. So those, those guys were like my, and, I, and you know, even back then in the comic books, there wasn't any credit given to anybody. So uh, at least I, I had a lot of DC comics, whereas I guess Marvel uh, was giving the credit back then. But where I lived in Massachusetts. It was all, we were all Green Lantern guy, you know, when we played, it was all, I'll be Green Lantern or John Jones or somebody. So, so anyway, I, I didn't have any, per se, idols other than Mark Drucker and uh, Jack Davis. And of course, the other, the other early, early influences were like J. Ward, which was the J. Ward cartoons with Rocky and his friends. And I just absolutely was uh, very uh, much influenced by that whole stylistic effect. Some of the comics I would write would be based on those characters back when I was uh, younger. The first comic people I started to like was when I did see Barry Smith in, in the uh, Conan comics. And I said, whoa, this is, this is artwork that I would like. And of course, it sort of coincided. Actually, I found The Hobbit before I found Barry Smith. But Barry Smith was, was an early one. And, um, uh, definitely Neil Adams out of comics. Uh, uh, Neil Adams was like, uh, I just couldn't believe how talented uh, he was. Uh, but then, I, uh, of course, uh, along with that, I was starting to formulate uh, the Howard Pyle, N.C. Wyeth, Brandywine connection. And it does, uh, well, obviously, even before that, uh, and I think I might have found. I'm trying to remember when I discovered Arthur Rackham because Arthur Rackham is like, you know, if you're a pen and ink guy, which everybody in comics is, he's, he's like, uh, he's one of the uh, the great gods of pen and ink. Other people from the comics that, that were really exciting for me were uh, Mike Kaluta. I love Mike's stuff. Um, he was another guy that got me all jack. Uh, Bernie obviously writes in. Uh, so I, I yeah, again, those guys weren't a whole lot older than me, maybe like a couple of years, but you know, to me, uh, they were like new discoveries. So uh, there was there was a whole bunch of them back then. I like like that. So so uh, you know, my career started basically when I did go to I went to Hartford Art School, 
And uh, again, I, I think I mentioned earlier in the interview that there was no illustration program. But I sort of found my way to uh, do illustration in the school. Uh, there was a school paper so that back in the late 60s, so it was uh, very uh, subversive in many ways. And uh, so I, I worked on the, the school. I, I never wanted anybody to know who I was, so I would do these comics and I would slip them under the door. And of course, I didn't want nobody to ever look these things up because the, uh, the spelling is atrocious in them. Uh, you know, I was, I, again, I, I was firing off with a ton of energy back then, so I had my, my, my schoolwork. So I did all my schoolwork back then, but then at night I'd go, hey, I gotta do my comic. So I would do this comic. And it was great because I could comment on things in the, uh, you know, <laughs> I, the, I don't know if I uh, take any, uh, well, let's see. I, I, I don't know how proud I am of this moment, but I, uh, I felt really powerful because I would award the Asshole of the Week Award. And it was usually to uh, some guy, and the, the fraternities were always doing all these ridiculous... Uh, I remember one Asshole of the Week I gave out for this fraternity that literally had a car wash set up in February, so you'd have to come around the campus and drive. But if you didn't go and stop at the car wash, they had like 10 guys with snowballs and they would pelt your car with it. Uh, or another, another great Asshole of the Week award was that they, um, <laughs> they, it, the, the campus was over this beautiful river that had rocks in it. And they spray painted their uh, fraternity logo on all the rocks in the stream. Like, I'm talking like 50 or 60 of these. So. So anyway, it was fun. I was able to, I, I learned that art had a little power back then. Now, did they have intern programs? No, they did not have intern programs back then. However, what I, I, what I was connected to the advertising, obviously, without illustration, uh, graphics and advertising were as close as I could get to it. So um, when I was in my junior year, an ad agency put a, uh, ad out and I answered it and I got a job at an ad agency which actually I created my own internship because then the advertising teacher just gave me credit for working in an ad agency so I learned a lot about I learned a lot in that agency uh, the ad agency was called Selwyn and Associates and actually it turned out un, I, unplanned that uh, Larry who ran it was the father of one of my roommates <laughs> but he didn't, uh, I, there was no, he didn't know the guy that Eric was putting an ad out. It was like a blind ad. So anyway, um, yeah, I did all the basic stuff you did back in there. I did paste up. I did uh, magic marker layouts. I, it was a very small, we had a lot of industrial accounts. Um, but I, I got me to understand type and uh, the, the uh, <laughs> it also got me my start in comic books because Larry liked to golf. So three days a week in the summer, he would golf, and he would be gone, and I'd get my work done. So I would just draw, I would practice drawing my comics for to get into Marvel. So that's what I would do there. So that was, uh, I always owed it to Larry. He, he was a, a very nice guy. You know, my comic career started, uh, Probably, as I, I, I went down to see a, um, a couple of my friends knew I was interested in. Uh, their father was a, uh, an artist named Gil Fox who lived in, um, down in Fairfield County. I'm trying to remember, it's Monroe or someplace like that. He was a wonderful guy. He and his wife were just very nice to my wife and to myself. And he introduced me, and of course he was uh, doing newspaper stuff. Oh, uh, one, of the, one of the people I met was uh, just the nicest, nicest crusty guy in the world was Jim Apero, who was doing Batman. And uh, I went to see Jim in and, and, uh, his house. And again, I'm trying to get into comics. I, I don't know how to do it, so I'm just trying to hit every opportunity I can. And uh, I had a portfolio, and um, 
Jim was talking to me, and it, it was it was great. He was telling me all kinds of things, and this is how I knew things were moving along because uh, his his wife, uh, and I'm trying to remember her name. It might have been Helen, but I'm not sure. She said, uh, "Oh, Jim is so excited. They have sent him so many people that are untalented," and she says, "He thinks you got some ability." And of course, that was you know, that little side piece was just really. Uh, really kept me going, you know, so, so, but anyway, uh, the first thing I think I worked on was this thing called Kong the Untamed. Uh, I, I, well, I, I, first I started, I had a record of being, when I first started in comics, anything they put me on was sure to be dead soon after I got on it. So I got in this, but anyway, uh, what gave me an opportunity, Joe Orlando was my uh, editor, and, and you know, Joe was like one of the guys from the golden age. I mean, and, and, and he was another, you know, or, 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 or. Uh, and it, the, the funny thing about Joe is, you know, I was, I was just uh, starting to, trying to get into comics. And I, I, you know, I had a lot of holes in what I could do still. And um, <clears throat> years later, uh, not, not a ton of years later, but far enough, uh, after I'd worked at Marvel and done other things, um, they asked, uh, DC asked me to submit sketches for this project called Warlords. And uh, I got a call and they said, Joe's going nuts. He says, he loves your artwork. He says, it looks like the old guy stuff, which is, you know, that's a huge compliment. And um, I think he, I gave him a piece too, but uh, he, uh, he really liked my stuff, but he didn't connect me at all to the guy that had sat in his, humbly sat in his office and listened to him literally. Well, and again, he, he had nothing but, you know, helpful information about how to do things, you know. So, so that, the, the, uh, the DC thing, I did two issues of Call Me Untamed before the first one came out, the second one didn't. So uh, then I, I don't know how I got connected to Marvel right away, but hmm. Anyway, I started going over to Marvel, and um, Marvel, uh, it was, again, they were all really nice, going to the bullpen, you know, knocking the door, you, you know, it was always, back then you could go in, you know, you go in and you sit in there saying you, had, you wanted to see somebody, you bring in a portfolio and you could show it. So, I mean, I, I, I brought my stuff in and I, they took me to John Romita, Sr., and um, he liked what I was doing okay. I mean, again, it, I was starting out, so I mean, there was holes in it. And um, uh, they brought, uh, Marie Severin worked there then, and Marie was really, uh, she was awesome. Marie was just such a wonderful person. And uh, she, she sort of took me in and mentored me. And then uh, finally, so they, what they did is back then, to, to bring you up for the Marvel style, they had this whole British line of comics where they would break the, uh, they'd take the monthlies from the U.S. and break them down into weeklies in, the, in, the, in Britain, because that's because they, they sell comics over there. So it was a great opportunity. I think John Romita Jr. was one of the guys that was with me. Uh, uh, one of the Copperbergs was in there. There was a bunch of us. Uh, I saw John Romita Jr. there. I didn't see everybody else who was doing them. Um, and then so they would give us splash pages or covers or, and it was, uh, uh, so I worked with, I worked with a whole bunch of different people. I mean, uh, sometimes uh, John Romita Sr. would help us, R Marie would help us, Larry Lieber was in there, he would help us, um, you know, and sit down. And then the guy that was really sort of, they assigned me was Dan Atkins, who was, was quite an inker. And I always loved it when Dan inked my stuff. He would. You know, he would, he would, I would go in and he'd say, all right, so I'm doing this and look what, I, this is what I'm fixing on your stuff. So, uh, but it was, it was, it was great. I mean, and they had a bullpen and you go out and hang out there and I got to know everybody. And I started working for Crack Magazine when I was there because, you know, they, they just, there was a lot of stuff I was doing. And then finally, uh, I ended up with the Avengers. I met Roy, you know, Roy Thomas, so. Anyway, that, that was the start of my adventure, my Marvel days.
When I worked on the Avengers, I worked with Jim Shooter, who was also the, um, at that point, the, the head editor for all of Marvel. So he had a very full schedule. And um, it was really interesting in that how he um, worked with me on that, in that um, it was a, uh, the story had been, the, the, the storyline that I was completing had been started by George Perez, who I happened to have a lot of admiration. Anyway, I was finishing off the story so uh, that he and Shooter had started. And um, uh, so the, this was the final cataclysmic end of it. Uh, in fact, it was, uh, from what I've been told, it's the first time that particular story and that, that superheroes actually were supposedly killed. Um, so I got to draw a lot of dead superheroes at the, at the big page of dead superheroes. Um, but uh, it was really an unconventional way to work in that normally uh, uh, if you work for DC, DC gave you a, a script and this is going to be on this page, this balloon is going to go here, this is, and so you'd work it out that way. Marvel had a different, I don't know if it's still the same, but Marvel back then they gave you a, a, on this page, this is going to happen. Without any script, without anything, on this page, this is going to happen. Well, <clears throat> I never got a script. Uh, Jim would call me like 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and he would dictate what each page was. And that's how I did that, that comic. So... Uh, we had a lot of interesting conversations. It was a bittersweet experience uh, in that uh, I thought I was going to be the Avengers artist for a long time, and then it did not work out that way. I won't go into any, anything else so that worked out. But I bought a house based on the fact I was told I was going to be the Avengers artist. Um, but luckily Roy was there, and Roy said, hey, I'll, I'll be more than happy to give you work. So that worked out well. And then I was getting other work, so. I worked on Savage Sword of Conan, too. Uh, I just mentioned Roy. Um, Roy, uh, Roy was very personable, and uh, I, I love the Conan stuff. I mean, uh, I had been reading the Conan books before. No, no, I'm sorry. I, did, I read the. I had started with Conan back when I was in college, and then I read all the books. Uh, so to me, when I got into Marvel, Roy was like a hero for me, um, and it was really easy to talk to. And so uh, there was a guy I was working with named Duffy Voland who was down there all the time and he uh, he always wanted me to draw splash pages so that he could he was trying to be an inker so he would bring them into Roy he would he was he was very gregarious so he would make sure that everybody saw the the what, what we were doing so uh, that's how I got into that and then um, after I worked on the Avengers um, Roy uh, offered me to start working on Savage Sword, and I, what I wanted, I really liked doing that because, um, you know, the system for comics was always that you, if you're a penciler, then somebody else inks it, and in Savage Sword, I got the ability to pencil and ink. So I did, I did characters like uh, Solomon Kane and Bran McMorn. I did you know, some. I didn't do any Conan strips, but I did a bunch of Conan pinups. In college, I got into The Hobbit. I mean, that was really sort of uh, molded me away from the art school um, uh, sort of figure drawing, painting, 
and I uh, nobody was doing anything like illustrating, and of course at that time nobody had illustrated the Hobbit because it was before it was still before the Hildebrandt calendars. It was before I didn't. Um, there was no figurative impressions of any of the Hobbit material out there. Um, the the book covers were very vague about what the world looked like. And I think anybody who reads The Hobbit sees that world in their head and they want to make sure, they want to see what it looks like. They want to, so I, even with my minimal skills back then, I decided that I was going to illustrate The Hobbit from beginning to end. And I did about 20 uh, pieces from The Hobbit and I did them all in circles, which is interesting. I have no idea why I even did that, but they were all in circular mats. Everything I did was in a circle. So anyway, uh, after college, I had continued to refine my Hobbit uh, material and where I lived at that time, uh, somebody opened a comic store and there had been no comic stores that was comic stores at your local drug store up until that time so it was this little uh, above above a market sort of uh, hole in the wall very nice guy named Norm and uh, he I asked him if I could put my artwork up on the walls and he was happy and he put them up and so uh, Charles Collins of Centaur Books was also a book salesman came through and saw the artwork they were looking for a project and they wondered if they could do a middle earth book now the problem was is that the Tolkien people really did not want a book of the hobbit with the hobbit text in it which didn't come out till i think michael haig did the first one a few several years after the Middle Earth book. So what we decided is that the book would be a companion so that if you got the Hobbit book, then you could buy Middle Earth and then you could see drawings that would sort of coordinate with the whole story. And so it was really based on my college um, envisionment of these circles. So a lot of the drawings were just pieces from my Hobbit and my, my college days that I re you know, re much better, way better than they looked in my college days. And of course, back then, uh, four color printing was extremely um, uh, limited because it was expensive. So many of the pieces were in black and white, which actually I sort of enjoy now uh, that, that contrast between the darks and lights. So that's essentially what the, the book ended up. Really interesting aspect of it is that that was I was just starting my career and I entered the cover of the book into the uh, Society of Illustrators annual and that piece got picked as one of the pages for it and here I am this young guy and they gave it a double page spread which in color, because back then the Illustrator's Annual was not all full color. It was a lot of black and white. And my artist friends were calling, but who'd you bribe? Who, who'd, you, who'd, you, who'd you pay off to get that? Like, I don't know. I don't even know how that happened. Now, the ironic thing was I thought that would shoot my career into the stars, and it really didn't. But, you know, that young illustrators often make the mistake of thinking they have reached a pinnacle when the pinnacle is still a little bit out of reach. But the the book is not. I think it holds up okay. I mean, I I see all the drawing mistakes and I see uh, plot things. So the the uh, the fun part about doing that was I got to do book signings. You know, those are the first big book signings I did, and uh, I there is a few um, technical Tolkien esque misses that I made that I did not quite follow the novels exactly and I learned that I really have to because the Tolkien several of the more involved Tolkien fans would come up to these book signings and they'd open up a page and go look 
the Arkenstone really doesn't look like that. The Arkenstone really has, and they were right, by the way. Usually fans are way, way more correct than we are. Yeah, I, I, I started my career, I mentioned I did Columbia Untamed when Joe Orlando was my editor. And then uh, a number of you, uh, and again, what was great about that one is uh, uh, Jim Pirro was sort of my art director, and so that I could take my artwork over to Jim and he would look at it and give me pointers. Um, I, have, I, had a, I have a great affection for Jim, but when he passed away, I was very sad. Um, so uh, a number of years later, uh, Paul Levitz contacted me and said that they had this assignment for the, uh, so I worked with Doug Monk uh, on uh, this thing called Warlords, which was a fairly large full color comic and um, which sort of, pr uh, uh, it was before I did The Hobbit, so it sort of was a prelude to what I'd be doing on The Hobbit where I did you know, all the ink line and watercolor, the whole thing. So uh, it, was, it was a pretty long story. So that was the next experience I had with, with uh, DC. When I, when I got into the comics in the, in the 70s, um, it was uh, before the big booms later on where, where you know, the, the McFarlane and the Image era. And it, it was still, like I said, it was a cool thing that you could, you know, you could, comic, Phil Suling had his comic conventions and, you know, the guys were all there and you could go down and, and that, those are really cool to go down to those. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was like, it was like, it wasn't corporate, but, uh, and it wasn't like it is now where, you know, they're, you know, entertainment giants. So I, I, I mean, I go to the, the, the Comic Cons now and, and uh, they're, they're awesome, but uh, I just remember back then uh, going to the, the kind of conventions that were just starting then, you know. Uh, Hal Keeney had the one up in, in Hartford and uh, obviously they had the New York ones. And I remember I'd see these packs of young men walking around, like when I say young men, like, like 12 to 14, and they would have rolls of money, like like a roll like this big, and the twenties, and they would just, you know, they would buy stuff by the truckload, you know. So I don't know if that, the, so the comic industry uh, uh, was a little different that way then, and it was all about comics. Now, if you do a comic convention, it's all about, you know, who's on the latest Star Trek movie or who's going to be in Game of Thrones this year. So it's sort of they're more like entertainment conventions, but back then it was straight comics. Um, but it, the corporate it wasn't there wasn't the huge corporation thing that it is now. Didn't create plus back then, back then uh, we had just got the right to get our artwork back as well, which was a huge thing. Remember, for years nobody got any artwork back, and that was a huge. You know, it's it's funny because. Um, you know, I, this is sort of a sidebar on the whole thing in that you realize that, that um, uh, artwork was considered to be absolutely disposable. If you think about newspapers and, and comic books, the uh, uh, pulp covers, you know, how many pulp covers were lost because when the, the artist got it back, they painted right over the original cover. Nobody, you know, it was, um, it was art that was to serve a purpose, which was to be photographed, and then that was it. And nobody thought it would have any value or anything like that. And um, it wasn't until the 70s that people started to really want it and value it. And so now, uh, it, you know, it's jumped into a whole new, new category. But back then, it was like, uh, you know, if you had an old newspaper, what happened, you know, an old Prince Valiant, those gorgeous Hal Fosters, it could go right in the bottom of the birdcage. The comics when I was coming up were really exciting for me because there was a lot of young men like uh, like I mentioned Barry Smith and Bernie Wrightson and Mike Kaluta, Howie Chaikin. You know they were um, I'm missing one there too. I'm trying to think of who I'm missing, but they were uh, they jacked a bunch of young guys. You know wanted to get into comics. You know the. Uh, 
it was a different look. Of, if, if you think about uh, the Marvel look and, and the Kirby look that have been around for years, or the Superman look, um, and with Carmen Infantino and all those, and, but then you think about what Kaluta was doing and what Wrightson was doing, and, and obviously Barry Smith was, you know, influenced by uh, many things outside of the comic world, and, and including, um, you know, the pre-Raphaelites. He was very influenced by them, and so they were bringing an energy into um, comics that um, appealed to my illustrator side. Um, I don't know if it had all been Kirby-esque type artwork, whether I've even wanted to do comics, but, you know, as the development of, uh, when Barry would ink his own stuff, it was just, you know, back then it was like, to me, like virtuosity, you know, because of the uh, ability he had. And again, he, he had, a, he was bringing in a much broader spectrum of art, uh, you know, if, if, if anything you've read about uh, Wrightson and Kaluta and, and uh, Sperry, I mean, they have really fine art influences, and uh, I think a lot of us do, and I, you know, I do. Um, maybe not the same ones that they do. I mean, obviously, um, even before I saw Barry Smith's work, I loved Alphonse Mucha, and so, you know, the, the whole Art Nouveau, and I think that's probably what sparked me to like Barry's work, is that, that, that I was a huge Mucha fan, and all of a sudden, here's a guy that is, even though it, his Conan stuff may not have reflected it, some of the elements he was putting in, you'd go, whoa, that's Art Nouveau. Yeah, so when, when you have a career in art, you have to um, cobble together, uh, at least at, at certain points in your career, many different aspects of it. So at the same time I was doing comics, I was also uh, had advertising jobs I had. And uh, one, of the, one of the things to, to create a, a money stream I did is that uh, I noticed that the Hartford Current had no editorial um, art per, per se. They had no, I, that was before uh, uh, they had a, a full time, uh, before Engelhart was there. So, um, so what I, what I, again, I just did these things on my own back then to try to make a, make a career for myself. So I just took a bunch of, I read the, I read the news and I read uh, the op-ed page and I would do uh, mostly I'd watch the news, and then I just did drawings that sort of, ref pen and ink drawings that reflected different things that could be going on that had a sort of a generic uh, undercurrent. And I sent a bunch off to Henry McNulty, and he said, keep them coming. And I think the, back then they'd give me 40 bucks every time they used one, and they'd use you know, sometimes two or three in a week, sometimes only two or three in a month. But uh, it was, a, and of course, you can, you can draw all day long and do different things, but if you have a family that values a newspaper and your extended family sees your artwork in the paper, doesn't matter what else you've done, you become like an artist. So that was kind of fun, you know. People see your work and they're, oh yeah, I saw that. So, and I make sure I, I had my Wenzel signature on everything. It was it kept me current. They were awful drawings, but yeah, being an illustrator, um, uh, the question is like uh, East Coast, West Coast now, you know. So uh, when I started out, East Coast was where you had to be, and West Coast was, you know, if you wanted to do animation and stuff. Which actually, it's still somewhat that way, but. Um, What's happened now, obviously, is West Coast is much more weighted for art because of the internet and the um, entertainment and CGI and all that. Uh, so, but essentially, uh, when I started out in a career, and I, and I think most artists from the 70s, probably into the 80s and even 90s would say, you got to you got to be somehow connected to New York, 
because New York is the, you know, all the publishers are down there, and of course, uh, your children's book publisher down there, all your comic book publishers are down there. Um, they weren't, you know, Image moved to the West Coast, but before they moved, everything was on the East Coast. So, um, East Coast was where it was supposed to be. I mean, m a lot of cities have a um, art community, you know, Boston or you know Chicago, but to be to be honest, the art community out of New York is is the art community. So you want you want to be somehow connected to uh, that. And then uh, of course over the course of my career, I started with the comics and the books, and then I started to I got a family, and I I needed to definitely have a income flow coming in. So I did get an art agent and I did a lot more children's book stuff. And that's when I got to work with Murray Sendak and uh, East Coast guy. Yeah, so the, the East Coast is was definitely back then where you wanted to be. Uh, I tell my students now though if you want to get into the entertainment industry you got to think about the West Coast. And uh, so East Coast is a, was where to be back then, and it still is. Uh, and um, but it, but with the, the internet and everything, it's again uh, if you're an older illustrator like myself, you've seen you know it was all mail in and fax machines, you know, uh, and then obviously the digital age. But the digital age is created. Uh, different things to go on as, as far as if there's a mistake made, everybody expects you can fix it digitally now. Back in then you had to do patches and all kinds of crazy stuff if there was an alteration in your art. Yeah, so the, the big break of my career uh, for me, I mean, it's been a wonderful trip for me even since the beginning goes back to uh, Larry Martyr, who again was my, you know, got me into Barry Smith and uh, turned me on to comics. In fact, in, in college we were trying to create a comic book that the school would publish and we collected a lot of different comics and it just never got the funding for it. But Larry uh, was connected to Eclipse Comics, um, so I didn't know this at first. So what happened is I, I got a call. Um, I, I said the only thing I'd go back for, come back to the comics was if I did The Hobbit, which I didn't think anybody was ever going to do The Hobbit, but that was that was sort of my catchphrase. And then I got a call, and Eclipse had garnered the rights to The Hobbit, and ironically, Larry had been driving back with them from the San Diego Comic Con. And they had mentioned it to Larry, and Larry, bless him, said, you got to get David Wenzel. That's what he does is a Tolkien, and he does comics. So that's how I got the job. And it's the only authorized comic edition of any of Tolkien's pieces. There's been unauthorized ones, but there's none that have gone through the estate, which this one did. So. Um, so, uh, again, uh, I had nothing but great memories of working with Eclipse. Um, <clears throat> we had to do The Hobbit in, in three different books. Uh, Sean Denning was my editor. Um, Chuck Dixon was the writer. And uh, so, what was interesting is that Chuck scripted it. Um, and uh, he had rough layouts, but they pretty much said, because I knew The Hobbit so well, they said, you know, you pace it how you want. So I did. You know, and that was really, you know, once they gave it to me, I pretty much could do whatever. I mean, it's really what you see. I did it all. I mean, I, and I don't, I don't mean to sound facetious that way, but I was enabled, they enabled me to just look at The Hobbit and translate it into panel artwork. The only, the only problem is I think it should have gone four books because um, the last part of The Hobbit 
a lot of stuff happens. The first part of The Hobbit is a lot of conversation, so it's really easy to translate. But the last part of The Hobbit almost reverts down to entirely no uh, interaction with dialogue, and it's, it's a lot of captions, <clears throat> and a lot goes on. There's fighting, and there's battles, and it would have been really good if we could have had a whole um, <clears throat> another book to do it with, get it, but you know, they're a publishing company with uh, money restraints. So the the, the whole Hobbit uh, book has been you know absolutely great for me. I mean, <clears throat> they keep rolling out Tolkien related materials so that even though I did that book uh, <clears throat> late eighties early nineties. It's been in publication ever since then, uh, and uh, it's, uh, all over the world. I mean, I have people send me photos of it, you know, be in Iceland or Israel, and they'll send me a photo. Oh, look, I saw it in Iraq. The great thing about the longevity of it has been phenomenal, and it, it did get reprinted um, because of the uh, the movies. But it's it's a gift that keeps on giving, and you know, um, when we reprinted it, we were able to make. A ton of improvements. Of course, uh, the, the UK edition is oversized, which is why that's the one I sell when I uh, do a convention uh, because it's such a superior edition. But it's been a, a wonderful project for me, and uh, you know, I'm still still doing Tolkien stuff. So I, I think once you start doing it, everybody wants it. So once I did the uh, uh, the the original book. Unfortunately, uh, Eclipse uh, had some problems and they <clears throat> went on business. And so the, I thought that was the, the end of the, the whole Hobbit thing. I had no idea that it was going to... So a number of years later, maybe five years later or so, I got a call from uh, uh, England and they said, look, we've been looking for you. No, they said they've been looking for me and that they wanted to start reprinting it again. So this was the Tolkien estate. This is Harper Collins. So they own, they had all the rights had reverted back to them. So they owned the whole thing, and they were looking to to reprint it. And um, they also had a big royalty check for me that that they've been holding. So that was a nice treat. And uh, so ever since then, they've kept that book in print, and they sell it all over the world and every time one of these new Tolkien things comes up they we put they put a new cover on it I mean uh, I, I know I got to uh, Donato Giancola who's one of my favorite illustrators um, who actually uh, came met me at a comic-con way back when when he was just starting his career out and he was just coming out of art school and now he's like huge um, he did a cover for one of them, uh, so it, it's been a, it's a, it, there's been a lot of reprints of it, but the, the latest one is the, the best one. So. Yeah, you, work, you work for a long time and you work for a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. Work for gaming companies, design figurines. I work with the, the giftware industry, designing three collectible lines of figurines. It is amazing how often <clears throat> they all have the same sort of the same things can happen. But uh, but uh, one of the, the the things that happened is I did the the, the gift industry, and I worked really extensively with a big company out of Boston area. And they, not due to me, but through other circumstances, they went out of business. So, you know, you live long enough, you get to see the, the cycle of life. It was called, it was a, uh, a concept I came up with about, uh, obviously, little, little guys that live in the fort called Hidden Kingdom. So Hidden Kingdom became the catch-all for, I did a, a Hidden Kingdom, uh, like, a, European fairy kind of, but it, they were fun little fairy kind of creatures. They were based on greeting cards that uh, uh, 
uh, my wife and her partner Sandy ran a, um, my wife Janice and her partner Sandy ran a, a, a card company named Hidden Kingdom Cards. Um, and they, they had a lot of success uh, selling, getting cards into stores, but that's a very hard industry to, to keep up with. Um, but there was a lot of licensing that went on with it and uh, the licensing for the figuring. So um, they liked the whole Hidden Kingdom idea, so they had me come up with three different um, worlds. And uh, one was uh, called the Hidden Kingdom. Uh, that was called Kingdom of Notch, rather. And then there was um, Kringle Hollow. And then there was um, Lady Elizabeth's Garden. And then when they came out, they produced two of the lines. And they were continuing it. And then they had a, a disaster that took place not related to my artwork. And I want to emphasize it wasn't related to my artwork that uh, caused them to have to go out of business. And been, the company had been in business for years. So. When I, after I worked in comics, well, when, actually, when I, as I was working with comics, um, I made a decision that I wanted to do children's books. I did get a, an art agent and I was able to grab a few books. Again, it started slow. And I was doing this at the same time I was doing comics. I mean, when I was, and again, my children's books were pretty primitive back then. I, mean, I don't really, um, but over the course of my career, I got to work on some interesting books. And ironically, I think the most successful uh, children's book I did was um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which I would have never imagined when I started my career that that would be a, a uh, strong part of my portfolio. Uh, but it was, it was uh, an oversized trade book, and it sold great for a lot of years, and uh, I just found out they actually put it back on the market with my drawings as a uh, board book. So it continues to be a hook in the water to net fish, so to speak. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I got to work with Marie Sendak on the Little Bear series. Um, you know, I got a, a Bank Street honor for the book, uh, The King of Little Things. So I've, I've had some successes. I like to keep my hand in that. I try to remember the different. Oh, I did pop up books. I did. I did a lot of different uh, subjects. Um, I, I worked with uh, uh, Max Licato, who is a well known Christian writer. Uh, yeah, I got to do a lot of interesting things. I did Treasure Island. Again, maybe people they some of these books didn't go out in mass market. I mean, the, 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 one of the, the nicest children books I ever uh, did was a, a series about this stuffed bear called Sebastian, kind of a Paddington kind of thing. The, I, did, I also did a, a cool children's book on the history of the American Revolution or the start of the American Revolution, and it's a very heavy, heavily illustrated book with... Um, Lots of different call outs, and uh, I had, I had a, my dining room table was stacked with different reference books because it was many different uh, uh, parts of that particular period. Um, but one of the other highlights of my career was that um, uh, they were redoing all the little bear books that Maurice Sendek and Elise Holman had done, and. Um, uh, they contacted me to uh, work on the books, but I knew that they had done an animation with it, and I had no desire to work in an animator style because I thought that's what they wanted. So I turned the job down, and um, I was through my agent. And then uh, I got a call one day, and they said, uh, would you like to hang on the line, and Maurice Sendak wants to talk to you. Oh, well, I think I'll take that call. And so uh, Maurice got in the line with me, and uh, he uh, 
really uh, not anything like I imagined Maurice, you know, and my, I, I had never seen an interview with him. I'd read all of his, his books when my kids were little, and, but uh, he was a very real kind of guy, and uh, he, he said that I could work, if I'd worked on the book, I could, did not have to do anything like the animation. And I said, look, Maurice, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do a tribute to your style. Um, so I'm going to make it look like I did it, but it's going to be your characters. Now, the weird thing about it was all the little bear characters in there. I think there was, he had done six, six or seven little bear books. He didn't have the same style in any of them. The character was somewhat the same, but the, uh, some of them were really realistic, some were very simplest. So I had to sort of come up with a, um, a, a homogenous style to do them. And, and um, it was, you know, Maurice was the art director, and I remember when I got the, uh, I got the, the, the first sketches, Maurice would make changes, you know, and those are the only sets of sketches he ever made changes. He, he okayed everything I did after that. But each of the tracing paper that came in the, over your drawing had a big sticker on it that said, you cannot keep this, return these to, to us. They didn't want anybody to steal, you know, because the first thing I did, I got an original Murray Sendak here drawn over my drawing. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, anyway, it was a great, great honor to work with Maurice, and I ended up doing 14 books, so I probably did the most books of anybody in that whole series. And, and part of it was, the sad part was that I would love to have had Maurice more contact with Maurice through the books, but he kept telling the editor, These are, he's the only one that are doing them, <laughs> so I don't have to make any changes. <laughs> so I got shot in the foot in a way because I was doing my job. So, so other projects I worked on, uh, I had developed uh, uh, this, uh, these two character, cat characters way back when, uh, called Whiskers and Roadkill. In fact, I developed it uh, back in the 70s to, do, to be a um, newspaper strip. And I, I submitted for syndication, and uh, which was, again, I was stupid back then. I didn't know how hard all this stuff was, but I got I got really positive feedback on it, you know. So uh, I worked with uh, Jim Maxner, who was helping write it, and uh, I was doing the writing and drawing, it, uh, and Jim was uh, part of that too. And uh, one of the characters were the cats. Those are these two cats that were apartment cats. Um, yeah. So so. But it, anyway, it was interesting because it was right around the time that The Simpsons were hot. And I had what we called it, what I, when I wrote it out, we called cat pan humor. You know, there was a lot of cat pan stuff and, you know, stuff. They, they, the cats lived in this apartment complex and so they were neurotic and they had all kinds of, you know. But when I uh, submitted this, uh, I got a call from uh, a woman who was uh, back then on a cell phone in the car, which was a big deal back then, you know. And she, she had a real New York accent, and uh, she goes, can you get it more over the top? And I go, well, they're talking about litter and poop, and, you know, uh, I mean, I used a harder, harder terminology than that. And she goes, well, figure it out. I mean, I, I said, cat intercourse, is that off this table? I mean, you know, anyway. I teach now. I teach illustration at Lyme Academy College of Art in Lyme, Lyme uh, Old Lyme, Connecticut. Um, I f sort of fell into teaching. Uh, there was uh, somebody who needed. They needed a, somebody to teach a uh, children's book course for you know five nights in the summer. I said I'd do it. That was something they were interested in, uh, which ended up being actually the illustration, the first illustration teacher they had at this college. And of course what's happened since then is that illustration is 
everybody who comes to the college, they're interested in illustration, so the department has grown. Um, teaching is very rewarding, um, and it keeps, uh, for an older, older man, it, it keeps me much more connected to what's going on in the society. Um, uh, I get a great, I have a great affection for my students. I, I feel like there are things I can offer them and help them to move towards careers in illustration. Um, sage wisdom, you know, advice, whatever. Uh, and and uh, we've been able to grow the, the program, so, and it's, it's just getting bigger. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, it's just, uh, teaching is uh, a, a uh, aspect of my career I hadn't anticipated. And uh, I very much enjoy it. So. Uh, my side mu career as a musician, for many years, I was had the my, I did not bowl, I do not golf. What I did is I played George in a Beatle band for years with authentic equipment and uh, it was interesting and at times as humbling as you could get. And, uh, but I had, I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, and after a while I got too old to be George in a Beatle band. So now I just get together with a few friends and play. But, uh, there's a, there's a lot of it's amazing how many if you start talking how many people play particularly guitar if you're a musician of, of an artist so and then remember let us all not forget the Beatles met at art school the the family that I from is sort of a unique artistic family which who would have known back then so. Uh, uh, you know, I met my wife, Janice, at art school, and she is a phenomenal art teacher, a phenomenal artist. She draws so much better than me on certain certain subjects. Um, she a, was a great painter. She can do anything when it comes to art, but she was a fantastic teacher. She taught uh, K through 12 through her art course of career. It was nominated as Teacher of the Year, so she, she's got a lot of uh, solid artistic roots and uh, of course it's great uh, us both being artists that you know, we love to go to museums she helps me she gives me good advice hopefully I can give her good advice um, and then uh, both my sons are very artistic my uh, one uh, Brendan who's my oldest son He's a very successful children's book illustrator. He just, uh, his first book called They All Saw a Cat, uh, got a call to cut honor. So that's a pretty uh, amazing uh, accomplishment in that the first book you get gets to have a call to cut and it's like a huge seller, still selling like, like crazy. Um, and he continuing, he's got a new book coming out. And, uh, he's got a new book out now called Hello, Hello. We couldn't be prouder, he's a wonderful guy. And uh, my other son, Chris, is also, he's not uh, doing uh, painting right now, but he's a phenomenal painter and uh, very creative. He did the piece that's above me in the mantle, which I know you can't see. Um, so all four of the members of this family are uh, artists and we have that sort of that bent. And then my brother, who uh, is also uh, an artist, he's a paleo artist, has two dinosaur books that he's done. Um, people may recognize if they bought the hardcover version of uh, Jurassic Park 2, the second one. He did all the uh, line drawings of the dinosaurs uh, in that. So uh, he's uh, quite the up on all, all the dinosaurs, we have great conversations when he comes by talking about that. So 
Yeah, we we are quite an artistic family, and if this is going on for posterity, I think it should be known. Mm -hmm.